I've got a question for you. Why is it important to know about the Constitution? Well, the Constitution is the supreme law, the highest law for our country. It's a list of rules and promises for our government and people to follow and obey in order for us to live happy and safe and free lives. The story of how it came into be written is a tale of persistence as delegates kept on despite obstacles at that time that made their, their tasks sometimes seem impossible. It's a tale of creativity. Being very creative, these delegates providing a framework for government entirely new. History might have gone a little different if it hadn't been for these men and the genius of these men. And we should be grateful to James Madison, to George Washington, to Benjamin Franklin, and the others who gathered in Philadelphia. We should be grateful also to the men and women such as Patrick Douglas, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Martin Luther King Jr., who in later centuries took up that work of these founding fathers, making this union that formed in 1787 a more perfect one that we know today. Now, let's go back in history, back to 1781, and listen to the story of how the Constitution came into being. Astride his favorite horse, Nelson, General George Washington looked on as thousands of British soldiers marched out of Yorktown, Virginia to lay down their arms. It was October 19th, 1781, and America, with the help from France, had just won the battle that would end the Revolutionary War. For the British, the loss was a shock. Theirs was the mightiest army in the world and they had thought it impossible that Americans could defeat them. According to tradition, the soldiers marching out of Yorktown to surrender played a song called, The World Turned Upside Down. For citizens of our country, living on the vast and bountiful continent, it seemed a new age was dawning. A free and independent America would surely prosper and become great in this mighty nation. But over the next several years, trouble became apparent. Americans had adopted rules for governing called the Articles of Confederation, and they didn't work very well. Congress, which was supposed to be in charge of the Confederation or Union of States, did not have enough power. It could not prevent states from printing their own money. It could not get them to help defend America or to pay off the debts from the Revolutionary War. Other countries, sensing the weakness of the United States, took advantage. The British refused to move out of military posts that were supposed to give up after the Revolutionary War. In Massachusetts, farmers couldn't pay their debts, rose up against the government. When they tried to seize a building in Springfield where guns and ammunition were kept, militia fired upon them. Americans were killing Americans. Was our country, which had so recently won its independence, now going to fall apart? In 1787, delegates from 12 states traveled to a convention in Philadelphia to figure out a better plan for governing the country. Congress had instructed them to revise the Articles of Confederation. But some were thinking well beyond that. James Madison of Virginia, the first delegate to arrive, had studied how nations worked and was convinced America needed a much stronger government than the Articles could provide. And he said it should happen soon. The go current government, he believed, was near collapsing. In his room at a Philadelphia boarding house, Madison, a small man of great learning, labored over a plan to present to the convention. His boldest idea was that the nation's government start with the people. As it was, state legislators were choosing the members of Congress. Madison proposed that the people have a direct say in who represented them. 
George Washington, who had returned to private life after the Revolutionary War, arrived in Philadelphia on May 13th, the day before the convention. Although he didn't like leaving his beloved home of Mount Vernon, Washington came to the convention because he was worried. Thirteen states, all pulling in different directions, were bringing ruin upon America. Bells rang out to celebrate Washington's arrival, and joyful crowds gathered to greet him. The people of Philadelphia remembered how this tall, dignified man had persisted in the darkest hours of the Revolution, when it seemed impossible that America would win her war for independence. They remembered how he had given up power after the war, when some had wanted him to become a king. All across America, he was loved and respected which made his presence in Philadelphia especially important. With him at the convention, Americans were more likely to look favorably upon the delegates' decision. Not until May 25th, 11 days after the convention was supposed to start, were there enough delegates for it to begin. 29 men gathered in the Pennsylvania State House, elected George Washington the convention's president, and made rules, including one that pledged them all to secrecy. James Madison had used the time leading up to the convention to present his ideas to his fellow Virginians. And on May 29th, one of the Virginia representatives proposed Madison's plan to the assembled delegates. As Madison, seated close to George Washington, took notes, Governor Edmund Randolph described a government of three branches, legislative, or the Congress, judicial, or the courts, and a national executive. The legislative branch would have two parts, or houses, with the people of each state electing the members of the first house. Some delegates argued that the people couldn't be trusted to choose their own representatives, but most disagreed. They thought they could. They thought the place for government to begin with was with the people. What nearly brought the convention to an end was the idea of the large states becoming more important. Under the Articles of Confederation, every state had one vote, but the Virginia plan gave more representatives and more votes to states with more people. Delegates from the large states like Virginia and Pennsylvania and Massachusetts thought that was only fair, but delegates from the small states believed that their interests would be trampled upon. William Patterson of New Jersey, scolding the delegates for going so far beyond the Articles of Confederation, presented a plan that preserved equality in voting. It was rejected, but the small states would not give up, and delegates continued to argue bitterly. The oldest delegate was inventor and statesman Benjamin Franklin. At 81, he had trouble walking and was carried in a chair from his home to the convention. Franklin commanded great respect, but not even he could get quarreling delegates to put their anger aside. Through most of June they fought, their tempers made worse by the hot weather, and they were in a building where they closed the windows and the doors to keep it a secret. It was sweltering as Roger Sherman of Connecticut proposed that in one house of the legislature, states be represented according to size, and in the other, the Senate, each state have an equal number of votes. But the idea went nowhere. Large states were not willing to give up anything to the smaller ones. Dr. Franklin suggested that the delegates send for a chaplain to lead them in prayer. The leaders of the revolution had sought God's help, he said, and so should those who were trying to build a new nation. The delegates did not send for a chaplain, but as the 4th of July neared, they did stop arguing long enough to appoint a committee to seek a way out of their difficulties. Acting on a suggestion by Dr. Franklin, the committee crafted what became known as the Great Compromise. It was Mr. Sherman's proposal more appealing to the large states by having all legislation concerning money begin in the first house of the legislature, where big states had more power. 
One evening in the garden, Dr. Franklin showed his visitors a curiosity someone had sent him. It was a two-headed snake preserved in a vial. Such a creature made the point, he said, that compromise was often crucial to progress. But when the committee took its suggestion for compromise back to the convention, delegates from large states still resisted. Governor Morris of Pennsylvania, a tall commanding man with a wooden leg, was particularly angry that small states were threatening to form a separate union unless there was equal voting in the Senate. The country would be united one way or another, he said. If persuasion does not unite us, the sword will. It seemed as though the convention might fall apart and with it, our country. With failure looming, a few delegates had char change of heart. In the close and momentous vote of July 16th, the convention adopted the Great Compromise. In one house, states would be represented according to population, and in the other, they would have an equal number of votes. The delegates moved on to the decisions, and by July 26th, they were ready to have a group called the Committee of Detail to work on organizing the points. While members of the committee were at work, other delegates took a break. George Washington went fishing. Gathering again on August 6th to talk about the draft, delegates soon took up a question they had discussed many times before. How should the president be elected? Should state legislatures make the choice or members of Congress? They finally agreed on a system of electors that would allow the president to be chosen indirectly by the people. The delegates also decided that the people should be in charge of ratifying the Constitution. Rather than seek the approval of state legislators, delegates chose to submit the Constitution to specifically elected conventions in every state. When the Committee of Style and Argument, the delegates assigned to write the final version of the Constitution. They got to work, they emphasized at the beginning of the document that the Constitution would be the supreme law only when the people decided it should be. On September 17th, after the final draft was read aloud, Benjamin Franklin addressed the convention. He told the delegates that there were parts of the document of which he did not agree, but that over a long life, he had learned that he was not always right. On the whole, he said, the Constitution was astonishingly good, and he hoped that other delegates who had doubts would join him in signing it. Several refused. George Washington, as president of the convention, was the first to put his name on the Constitution. Then 37 others followed, state by state. As the last delegate signed the document, Dr. Franklin looked at the sun painted on the back of George Washington's chair, and he saw it as a sign of a new beginning for America. By July 4, 1788, the people of 10 states had, after sometimes fierce debate, ratified the Constitution. Since only nine states were required to make the Constitution the supreme law, it was time for a celebration. In Philadelphia, after early morning bells and a cannon salute, crowds lined the street to watch high-stepping horses lead a parade of flags, bands, and floats. A carved and painted 20-gun ship, the Union, made its way through town on its carriage. The grand federal edifice, a specially constructed building honoring the Union, passed by pulled by 10 white horses. Citizens of every occupation marched. Weavers followed chair makers, bricklayers and gliders, bookbinders and coppersmiths and clergymen. And at the end of the parade came feasting and an oration. Happy country, proclaimed the convention delegate, James uh, Wilson. May thy happiness be perpetual. Under the Constitution, America would become the nation George Washington imagined, a place of freedom in which people can aspire to high goals and seek happiness, a country exemplifying the blessings of ordered liberty. But the Constitution that the delegates signed in Philadelphia in 1787 was not perfect, and becoming aware of that, delegates included in the Constitution ways of changing or amending it. 
The first 10 amendments, called the Bill of Rights, was passed by two-thirds of the Congress in 1789 and ratified three-fourths of the states in 1791, providing protection for the many rights we have as individuals. They include safeguards for freedom of speech, religion, and the press. Amendments added after the Civil War did away with slavery and provided that the right to vote will not be restricted on account of race. In 1920, the Constitution was amended to recognize the right of women to vote. The document created in Philadelphia in 1787 has changed our country and has changed, growing in justice over the years. Once there were Americans who looked at the Constitution and did not see themselves. Today, we the people, includes all of us, working together to make our country, our great country, greater still. And now I'd like to read you a really short little book called We the Kids. This is a short little book and it's about the preamble to the Constitution. And a preamble is an introduction part. A part of the preamble sounds like just what we'd naturally do, kind of common sense. But a couple of hundred years ago, things were really, really different and things weren't common at all. There were rules, there were not rules to follow. And you know, for instance, if if you wrote something or said something that the people in charge didn't like, why well, they could throw you in jail or they could tar and feather you. Oh my goodness. Now, even though our country's changed a lot, if you listen really hard, the rules in our constitution still make good sense. And now we use tar for paving roads and the feathers, they can still stay on the chickens. There's some big words in this book and I'll try to explain some of them to you. But these big words also express big ideas. And also, look for the dog in this story. He'll help you understand more about what this book says. We the Kids. This is a book illustrated and forwarded by David Catro. We the People of the United States. Now that means everybody in our country including kids, in order to form a more perfect union. That means to come together, to make things better for everyone who lives in the country. Establish justice. Now that means to make things fair and honest for everyone. See the rules? It says make fair, share, no pulling hair. Ensure domestic tranquility. Now that's a big word. But what does that mean? That means to make sure that we all can have a nice life and get along with each other. Provide for the common defense. Well, now that means to protect us from harm and other people who might try to harm us as in war. To protect our country and the kids. Promote the general welfare. Okay, that means to make life good for everyone. Having enough to eat, having a place to live, being safe, and having friends is part of what makes our life good. And ensure the blessings of liberty. That means to protect our rights and freedoms and not let anyone take it away. Being able to choose our religion to say what we think, and to get together with friends and family is part of the freedoms that we have. To ourselves and our posterity. Oh, that means kids, parents, and other grown-ups born in our country after we were. Do ordain and establish this Constitution. That means to write it down and then live by the list of rules that are for our government and help our people to obey these rules for the United States of America.